Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Address the Sess. Um, I have survived PAX. Actually, s surviving PAX isn't that challenging. It's just all the different days and walking on concrete floors. But I'm here. We can talk about PAX. We can talk about, well, now that we have a date for PlayStation 4 and for the Xbox One, if there's any significant about it, we can talk about indie games. We, we can talk about shoes, because it is getting time for fall. And that's when people buy shoes, I think. I don't know. I Shoes just magically appear. My wife is like, here, you're smelly. Try out these. Uh, everyone say hello to Nick. Hi, Nick. Hello. Hi. Hello. There we go. Um, Nick, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and talk to our first guest who's already in here. But if you want to start pulling more people in. Yeah, sounds good. Right. Uh, here's our first guest, Max Gruber. Max, how are you doing? Hello. I'm doing great, thanks. All right, so I'm glad you're able to make it on this time. I know that this was a challenge for you last time. We definitely got lost uh, in, 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 in quite a big conversation. Didn't get to everybody. But uh, what's 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 on your mind? Where, where, where are you contacting us from first? Uh, contacting us? I am from uh, Florence, Kentucky right now. Uh, and uh, the first one I really wanted to ask was something I wanted to ask since E3, um, and that is... Uh, do you think that uh, uh, that Square Enix will make a comeback in this upcoming generation? Because at E3 they announced uh, Final Fantasy XV, uh, Kingdom Hearts III, and uh, Lightning Returns looks surprisingly good. Um, uh, you yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, and I bag on Square a lot, I, I think you're right. Obviously, even Kingdom Hearts III kind of made me go like, eh, okay, I'm paying attention. I think Square's challenge hasn't been that their games aren't good, with the exception of their attempts on doing uh, on on the MMOs. That seems to be a little bit more. But you yeah. know, L L Lightning Returns, Kingdom Hearts Three, those should sell really well. Where Square seems to have these problems is that they don't have games that are coming out in any consistent way. And my biggest hang-up is Lightning Returns. I, I might be wrong on this, but Lightning Returns nor Kingdom Hearts Three had a release date. Yeah, that and uh, uh, Final Fantasy Fifteen. Also Final Fantasy does not 15. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's that's that's kind of part of the problem. Not that they had to say it's coming out on this particular date, but like, hey, you're going to have it next year. You're going to have it then. What happened for so much of this generation is they would show us something that we wanted to see, and then you know they 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 become so indulgent in their development process that things don't come out, and they don't be able to maintain that relationship. I don't think we should have a new game in a franchise coming out every single year. At the same time, when you wait that long and you're that inconsistent with your audience and your community, that's where people start to move on. They start to find other interests. So I, I think it's really all in Square's court to be able to sort of be able to maintain the conversation going on these games and make sure that they come out. Yes, we all want them to come out when they're good and done, but you know, it's taken a while for Kingdom Hearts 3 to even be acknowledged, much less get a date and then be completed and be put in, 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 in people's hands. They, they, I, I'm afraid that these grand masters of two generations ago with their game design are almost left too much to their own devices, and they're not sort of disciplined enough to really get the games done so that A, don't cost a pair of company too much money, and that they get out there when the iron is hot and when people are interested to see them. But uh, obviously, there's, I don't see anything wrong from what I've seen already about those games. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be frank. I bet I'm not going to play one of those two for three more years. And I think another uh, thing that they really have to address very much so is, like, how much they expect their games to sell and just their level of expectation in general because they were, they were expecting, what was it, Tomb Raider to sell uh, 6 million units, but it only sold, what, 3.4 million? Only. Which is still a very yeah. respectable sale. And, and, and then, and then it, that's, yeah. And uh, also, I was reading this a while ago about um, about Lightning Returns. Uh, the director of the project, Multimo Toriyama, and, like like this this completely blew me away by just how incompetent he is. He says that, uh, and this is a direct quote from him. He says that he wants the game to defeat Skyrim, defeat Skyrim, <laughs> yeah. Skyrim, right? I mean, it, it's great if it does, which I highly doubt will happen, but, you know, y you're going to have to do more than add, you know, breast physics and increase the bus size of your main character for that to happen. 
No, no, no. Which, and obviously, there were some very strange comments from Kojima today about the uh, highly erotic characters and how that's going to be good for the game. In addition, Inafune-san has uh, said that, you know, Japanese development has been able to keep pace with Western. And the fact is, the appetite for that very traditional JRPG, those kind of gameplay tropes, is not what it once was. And it, it's worth remembering that a lot of those RPG styles were really born out of the technical limitations of the time. You know, action exactly. RPGs were not easy things to make, and so, you know, the, the original Zeldas were very limited in their RPG-ness. Uh, now we can do that, and so, I'm not saying you abandon the turn-based qualities or, or, or the style in which they're played, but you kind of need to make a case for it inside of the game. You can't exactly. expect that there's just a sense of loyalty to that. And yeah, comments like that do sound a little... Uh, uh, a little Ridiculous. Tone death. Yeah, and, and that, you know, there's, there's no need to be making these strong statements, especially when, you know, there, there, there's, there's so many other questions going about, like, how that genre really is being played out. I mean, you know, there's no need to say, I'm going to defeat Skyrim. You can just say, I'm hoping to make the best game I've ever made, and that should be exciting enough for a lot of people out there. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I, was re I remembered watching this from, uh, I th it was from Extra Credits, where they were talking about how you know, these gameplay mechanics or, you know, like, these conventions does not define a genre, like, like the turn-based genre, as an example, or the turn-based gameplay, for example, you know, that doesn't define Final Fantasy, that doesn't define Nino Kuni or um, yeah. Lost Odyssey or anything like that. I mean, like, XCOM, XCOM is turn-based, but you don't consider that to be a JRPG yeah. or an RPG in general. You I consider mean, it to be more of a strategy game I, than an RPG. I, I kind of wish that they would take lessons, though, from, from Western approaches to that genre. Like, I've, I just started playing Fire Emblem, and I kept trying to put my Fire Emblem units into Overwatch because I've played so much XCOM, and <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not a realistic <laughs> expectation, maybe, but I do wish, like, it feels like maybe sometimes the lessons are being learned in one direction and not the other, if that well, makes sense. Well, I, I, I think also turn-based, you kind of know what that means. That, 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 that's a very practical term, yeah. but, you know, genres are becoming less and less useful. It really is just kind of a shorthand if you don't have the game in front of someone to explain how the game plays, but they're becoming less defining of what the game is and what the game experience is going to be, and I think XCOM is an excellent example of that. Um, when, yeah. when it does come to a lot of sort of Japanese game design, you almost feel like the tradition of the genre dictates the game rather than helps inform kind of some interesting parameters that can be experimented with. And I think that's what needs to be happening on the Japanese development side. It's not that all Japanese games are bad, but we're really seeing, especially with the major franchises, and I would still say that Final Fantasy falls into that, where it seems that no one's asking the important questions, do we have to play the game this way? You know, are there interesting ways we can experiment with that still honor the traditions, but aren't absolutely just, just you know, tied down because that's just how we've been doing it for the past 20-some-odd years. Hmm. Um, oh, on yeah. the subject of uh, Japanese game design, we've got some questions from the chat. Um, uh -huh. Jeremy Nauf and Zeno Dark both say, uh, what do you think of the Mighty Number no. 9 announcement from Inafune? I think that's very, very interesting. Um, I also find, I think there was like a tweet or something from Capcom UK that was like, we had no idea people wanted this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mega Man, uh, no, I, I, Mega Man fans. I like... What I love about it is it feels so honest. Like, he's wanted to do this. He's frustrated. Screw it. Does it really have to have the Mega Man name? No, it does not. We are more interested in what the gameplay represents and what his creative legacy would inform us we would get to play. Um, it was very, very exciting. I'm, very, I'm hopeful. Well, no, we already know he's going to make what he needs. I hope that, you know, we can start to see the development of this process go forward. Um, also, just to see someone of... Inafune's legacy, want, you know, the, to, 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 to see him go in the Kickstarter direction. I think for a lot of people who say, like, oh, no, these guys aren't supposed to be doing these Kickstarters, they have all this money. I think it also reminds people that these are creative, you know, individuals that would like sometimes to really not have to be shackled down by the needs of a marketing department, of the boys in research who say, oh, no, this is how people want to play it. Um, this could be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Hey, Nick, do you want to bring somebody else into the conversation? Matt, yeah, we'll keep you uh, uh, still there so we can maybe get a conversation going. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a Sashin Mori. Sashin. You're muted. Oh, I can kind of hear you. You can kind of hear you. How's this? The crappy there we mic. go. There we go. So where are you, Sashin? Am I pronouncing I, that correctly? 
It's a uh, session. Long session. My apologies. No problem. Um, I'm out here in the San Gabriel Valley in California. Oh, I bet it's nice and cool. Oh, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is way yeah. too hot it's out it. here. It's, if, if, if it's hot in San Francisco, which it is today, and I apologize to everyone, as you probably will watch my forehead get increasingly more glistening, uh, yeah, it's got to be just awful out there in the San Gabriel Valley. Anyway, oh, what's on your mind? Uh, not a whole lot. I actually, it's, I'm very late, but I just played Journey the other day. And, Ooh, uh, I'm glad you finally nice. did that. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, I'm, it was on sale because of packs going on all that, so I finally picked it up and uh, got to play through it, and... Uh, Wow, that was a magical experience, and something it I really didn't expect from indie game. Yeah, now obviously this is this, this this is an indie game that had a fair amount of funding. It actually it had a full throated support from Sony. I'm curious, okay. what kept you away from Journey until now? Was it just the price, or was it also the uncertainty of what the game experience would be? It was uh, it was a lot of uncertainty, just because um, you know it, it's one of those things where it got such rave reviews. Everybody was talking about it like this is the greatest game. This is the you know game of the year 2012, and it, it was a little off-putting because you know it's like I didn't want to walk into it and expect something insanely amazing and be disappointed because the same thing happened to me with uh, the Uncharted series. It was a great series all in all. Uh, the my favorite was uh, Uncharted 2. But, uh, As it should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't live up to the hype that everyone had put it up to, saying, you know, this is the, you know, series for the this generation of consoles. So um, now that you play Journey, okay, I, I, I guess the first question is, is Journey the first game like that? And it's very hard to describe what Journey is like, but something that really does not cue to it. As with our earlier discussion about genres, you know, there is no genre. For, oh, for yeah. Journey. It's just what it is. Are there, are there other games that you've played in the past that kind of fall into that same category of something that is kind of very fresh and innovative? Um, not, not, recent, not, in, not in since recently. I mean, Journey was the first one that really just had that huge standout. Mm -hmm. uh, Minecraft, when it came out, was kind of the yeah. first thing that I had ever seen. Like, wow, the... I've never seen this, you know, the whole voxel engine and all that. That was, like, amazing. And I think it's just that thing where, you know, uh, you don't have to worry. Like, AAA developers, they kind of have to worry about putting out that profit and putting out that... Mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, the price development costs have skyrocketed ever since, and you're seeing, like, all these publishers, like, saying, like, oh, our game has made 3 point or like three million units, and that's a disappointment for us. Like, uh, yeah. oh, like yeah. with Capcom's Resident Evil Six, where they were extremely disappointed with the sales, and that it was considered a failure. They so shouldn't have been disappointed with the sales. Or something else, they should have been disappointed <laughs> right. with Resident Evil Six. They should be relieved. Yeah, exactly. Of copies. <laughs> it's like going, ah, oh, I stepped in poop. Why is everything so stinky right now? I don't understand it. So, um, Sasha, uh. uh now that you play Journey, do you think you're more comfortable playing things that are far more experimental in their design? Oh, definitely. Yeah, uh, I, I would. I would definitely take a swing at Gone Home and Brothers. That Brothers is one that I've been wanting to take a look at. I haven't yeah. actually heard of Gone Home. Gone Home, it's, it's right now. It's available on Steam. It is a short game and it's a little pricey. I know some people have had some uh, issues with that, but it is like Journey is just an experience. And it, you know, it's one of these great examples where, where, where story and design are. There's, there's no line. It's just, it's, it's, it's all into one thing, and it, it is by far one of the most affecting games I've, I've ever played. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of cool. And I've only gone through this recently, where you know, I, I love seeing experimental stuff. But I've started to play games. Journey was right there at the beginning, where it's like, yeah, there's something really exciting about what's going on here. Because for me, and I have to talk about games all the time. I didn't have the words available. So I didn't know how to describe it because it was so different and so new. It's it's almost cinematic in its own way. Yeah, except it's not, and it is. Yeah, it, <laughs> so, it is, but not in the everything. sense that how like the next generation of games is moving towards that movie aspect. Like right, where we're, we're more online games, games than uh you know than standalone single player titles. Yeah, well, I, I think it's also. I, 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 Cinematic is not the word I would use. It's kind of the idea that you really are more in control of the story. That, you know, it's obviously not stopping down to tell you what's happening. 
but you're kind of creating things within that world in a way that you didn't expect, you know? We were oh, used oh. to Mass Effect with your moments of choice, and then you go yeah. back to playing the game. This is all happening at one time, and you know that you're not having the same experience as everybody else out there, and that's, that, that, that's really exciting. And it definitely was. I mean, I watched, um, after I had played it, uh, my girlfriend, she came home and she played it, and watching her play it, it was a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. For me, it was I, I traveled most of it by myself, and then had one person come in towards the end, uh, you know, and we trekked up together, and it was just that kind of moment. But for her, it was almost like she had like um, a master the whole time, and she was an apprentice because she had someone who had played the game obviously multiple right, times. Right, right. All the how interesting the little things were. Huh. In. So that, it was that's just like, really it was such a different thing to watch her play and versus the way I played it. Did the I other like character that. have like a super long scarf because they played oh. through it so many times? Yeah. Yeah. I always get worried when you do see the characters like that. Like, you know, one bad. If, okay, if I had a scarf in real life that long, I would have been as asphyxiated like years ago. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nick, you want to bring somebody else in or do you want to grab yeah. something from the chat? Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's hear from uh, Dominique. Um, let me pull him up. I'm going to click you in there, Dominique. Hello there. I think you need to unmute yourself there, Dominique. There we go. I think. Maybe. No. Hello there. There we go. Hey. There we go. Where are you um, located? Uh, England. England. Where, where in England? Uh, Cumbria. 45 minutes from Scotland. Yeah. Yes. A little north. A little north. Uh, what, what's on your mind? Obviously, you probably didn't make it over for PAX. This year, which uh, is completely understandable with that whole I was in Scotland, I was in Cumbria yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, my thing is, uh, GTA 5, uh, what's your thoughts on it coming out? And also, do you think the leaking of the storyline will affect sales or will it just bring more people into it? I don't think the leaking is going to affect sales. I mean, the thing, we're, we're now so used to so many big games having some type of leak. I feel bad for the guys that worked on the game because I think, that, I, I know with Rockstar, Great efforts are put in place to try to keep everything under wraps, and it sucks for those people that don't want to have it uh, told to them. And you know, there's more than enough trolls out there that just you know really get off on doing something like that. In, in, in terms of your first question, what do I think about it coming out? It's coming out. That I I'm, I'm dead certain yeah. about. But do you think it's going to be uh, say better than GTA 4 and live up to the expectations that many felt GTA 4 would have? I you know I I I mean what well, I've seen of it it looks better it looks like it plays better um, they definitely have experimented with it uh, Rockstar is actually very good about always improving I mean even with GTA 4 and then you had uh, Lost in the Damned and Ballad of Gay Tony you already saw them recognizing some of their limitations and trying to fix that as as they went forward and, you know for for all of their attitude for all of their reputation they are almost obsessed with beating themselves every time they put an, an, a, a, a new game out there. And that's why I think one of the reasons why I'm thoroughly excited to play the game. Don't know when I get to do that, but I'm very, very excited about getting my hands on it and, 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 and getting to review it. Um, I'm obviously not going to prognosticate if it's the best game ever, if it's the game of the year or anything like that, because I'm nowhere near to you know, coming to that conclusion. But I can say on a very personal gamer level, I'm ridiculously excited to play the game. I mean, I love playing GTA. Helps yeah, me. I mean, it is. I, I know because it's like, like Call of Duty, because of its prominence, it gets a lot of detractors. But there is a reason it rose to that level of prominence because there is game design that happens within Grand Theft Auto and some of the other open world Rockstar games that is just always surprising and always astonishing, if not always perfect. So you want to know this? This is barely related, but I was reading an interview with Dan Hauser recently where he said that he doesn't watch. Breaking Bad or any crime shows or movies because he doesn't want that to influence the story that he brings into games like Grand Theft Auto V. I wonder how that's going to affect... Because I remember when we first well, saw well, some it, of the... It's interesting because I have seen stuff from the game which is definitely informed by other crime films that are out there at the very least. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the wealthy character of the three that you get to play in the game. And because he's just kind of a layabout and has nothing to do, all he does is watch television and it's kind of a fun way that you get to sort of incorporate 
this 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 larger crime media into the game. So yeah, and uh, it's weird too because every time a new Rockstar game comes out, everyone's always like, "All right, which movie is this based on?" Like it's almost feels like every game they make is pseudo based on like like Boys in the Hood or like Old West. Like there's always some influence, and I thought it was really interesting that he goes out of his way to not be influenced by contemporary crime fiction. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think it's also that it's one thing if you honor something that has become. Amazing! Like you really see that in Red Dead Redemption. Like you can see the movies, you can see the moments from The Wild Bunch, you can see the moments from High Noon, and uh, I, I, I hope I'm not spoiling this for anyone. You know, towards the end of the very end of the game, I couldn't help but think, "Huh, they haven't done Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid yet." And then I got to the end of the game. Uh, so I think I, I could almost see the logic where you don't want to be too informed by contemporary stuff because then it feels like you really are kind of stealing ideas. You're not taking what has now become part of the popular imagination because something became so big and so established that you get to turn it on your ear and have your fun with it. That's kind of similar to what Tarantino does, except he does it in a very knowing way. So, uh, Nick, Nick, is there anything interesting out there in the chat? Yeah, there is. Um, let's see here. Um, Axe325XXEXE <laughs> asks, Adam, uh, what are your thoughts on the 2DS? It's going to go on sale. Yeah. Uh, no, no. It, it's, you know, I had a good chuckle to myself because it just seemed like one of those kind of like, okay, Nintendo, what are you doing? It starts to make sense after a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's cheaper. It was going to be perfect for young kids. It's going to be perfect for Pokemon. Uh, one of the reasons why I think it is very good for a younger kid is um, when, when you hold the th 3DS, especially the 3DS XL, that top screen does add this kind of funny weight and you need to kind of keep it upright and you're having to force against it. It's much lighter. It's obviously distributing the weight very evenly around it. Um, you know, and there's a lot of 3DS games that don't need 3D that much. You, you know, it, it, it seems like a sensible thing and that maybe uh, it will keep some younger siblings from tearing at each other's throats because there's only one 3DS in the house. Mm. <laughs> and it allows for a purchase of both Pokemon X and Pokemon Y. And I, I, I can see the business strategy in it. Do I think I'm getting one? I'm not running out to pick that up. It doesn't really supplement the need that I've had, but it's also not something that I, that I, I, I treat with derision or mockery. Word. Uh, Dominique, Max, Session, do you have any thoughts yeah, on yeah. the 2DS? Uh, shall I go first? Uh, my thing is that it's going to be something that a kid can have, which is like Mommy and Daddy have, like they have their iPads, yes. their Samsung Notes. I believe one of your colleagues probably mentioned that, or yeah. somebody has. And, and, and to be fair, uh, you probably can still have a little bit more fun on your 2DS than if you're playing just any random game on your iPad or any other form of tablet. So, <laughs> Max, what are, you, are, are you running out to get yourself a 2DS? Uh, no, not really, but uh, the thing about uh, the 2DS and the Wii U, uh, I actually heard about this before, was that it, the, if you think about it, what is the base of the Wii U and the 2DS? Like, who are they aiming for? They're, they're aiming for those people that are so blinded by their nostalgia goggles, like with, these, like with Mario, Zelda, uh, Metroid, Donkey Kong, etc. And it, it's got, like, these people are probably already adults. And so they see these and they think, well, that was fun, but there's no way in hell I'm getting a Wii U or something that could just relive my childhood when I could get a PS4, you know, unbelievable graphics, like way better titles, like higher quality titles, just all around better, or an Xbox I One. Are, I mean, I wouldn't say that necessarily just because it's PS4 or Xbox 360. Obviously, it's to be technologically more powerful. I don't think that necessarily makes it better. I mean, what I, I think always surprised me about you know you know the Wii U is that they didn't target the nostalgia that they seemed to target the Wii audience who weren't paying attention didn't really understand what it was that like had there been more nostalgia on the launch of the Wii U I think more people would have perked up like like you know the the the, the Mario game that's coming out at the end of the year which I'm not still falling over myself for but I think is much stronger than the the new Super Mario Brothers game from last year that should have been coming out last year. And, you know, I think some of the, the interesting stuff we're finally getting to see now had it been out there when the Wii U launched, I think more people that really like Nintendo and pay attention to what Nintendo was doing would go, okay, that's a pretty strong case. 
Uh, I mean, well, it, it, I would love to see Nintendo mm -hmm. innovate, but that's not seem that doesn't seem to be working for them. Actually, mm -hmm. dealing with that core base that loves Nintendo and just kind of wants a slightly modified version of what they do, you know, generation to generation. That's a safer, wiser, and probably more profitable way to go at the beginning. Well, I, your I, com I, your comment about um, sorry about that. Uh, your comment about uh, the people who bought who who are buying it for the Wii. I think they're probably suffering from the Wii syndrome. That was. You bought it, you played the games really excitedly, like, and then it, it kind of tapered off, then you put it away, like, put it in the closet, yeah. gathered dust, and then it, at one point, you, some friends came over, and they would say, like, ooh, that looks really interesting, and you'd play that, and then it just gathers dust again. Okay, but that's the thing. It's what I've said about casual. They did very well with the casual audience. Casual does not mean informed, it does not mean excited, it does not mean, you know, passionate. And those... Those three things are kind of essential if you're going to buy a console at launch when it costs the most amount of money. That's where I think the misstep went. And, and you can understand how they made the mistake of calling the Wii U the Wii U because the Wii was so insanely successful for them as a piece of hardware. But I think something that I don't understand about Nintendo right now is their continued reliance on really bizarre naming conventions. Like, the Wii U has been struggling with the fact that a lot of people out there genuinely don't know the difference between a Wii U and a Wii, and now the 2DS is going to have the problem where parents show up to buy their kids a 2DS for Christmas and then look around the store trying to find 2DS <laughs> games and can't find any 2DS games because there's what? no such I thing as a 2DS game. That. That's a very interesting point. I, 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 I think, yes, I, th I think the clever naming thing needs to kind of be brought back. <laughs> That's actually a, a really bit. good point, Nick. <laughs> it is, is, is someone, like, I'll just be in a game store and... Okay, here's still my favorite story of all time. This was many, many, many years ago. I got a phone call from someone that I worked with who didn't know anything about video games, and their uh, nephew, I'm putting them at seven years old, really wanted a copy of Grand Theft Auto 3, and they wanted to know if it was appropriate. The name of the game is a felony. <laughs> <laughs> that should be one of the strongest and easiest indications about appropriate is if <laughs> it's described... <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing, is that you do have a lot of people that are buying for other people in their lives, and they don't know enough about games. You need to kind of work with that low information level with your naming conventions and with how you market things. And Nick, let's, let's bring somebody else in. Cool. Uh, let's talk to Charles Gar. Charles. Where are you? Right here. Right and where are you reaching us from? Georgia, actually. I just moved here. All right. Uh, did you move there for a school, or...? Um, trying to mix the family, mix the school. I was in a dead state. Okay, all right. Wait, where state? Uh, South Carolina. It's like nothing there ever. No, but you said yeah. You you said dead state. Like that was like a state school in the city of dead. And like that's actually kind of an interesting concept that I wouldn't mind playing with one day. So yeah, dead state would be a great name for a video game too. Um. So Charles, uh, you all fallen over yourself with the two DS? Um, actually, no, because I'm much more, like, I don't, to me, like, having the 3DS portability is much more uh, essential to me, since I'm a college yeah. kid, just going to be moving around a lot, and I would love to just get it in my pocket. Yeah. And no, so no, no, I'm no, I, that, thinking that makes still the 3DS. So, what's so I can, uh, um, I honestly, um, what do you think, with this whole rise of indie stuff, what do you think the... Do you think there will be a real reaction to publishers trying to get indie companies or an indie content into that company, or do you think a lot of indies are just at stay indie? Well, and then, you know, I actually brought this up in a series of interviews that I was doing with the developers over at PAX, and we're going to have a lot of those interviews coming up on the, on our channel next next week. We, we're going to kind of make next week kind of an indie themed yep. week from from PAX. Um, it's not like people are saying, oh, my God, I just want to be independent. Yeah. You know, because it's financially not awesome. Uh, it also, you know, it's, it's very hard. There's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that. But there are certain benefits that come with independence, and that's creative control. So what ideally might start to happen is that, you know, publishers are going to look at this remarkable talent. They're going to want to bring them in so they can take it, you know, benefit from them down the long run and kind of find a new way of relating where there, there, there is some degree of creative freedom, but then again, the indies give up a little bit of that freedom because they can actually get a budget. They can have a few more people. They can have an income so they're not worried every day about where the next, the next check is going to be coming from. I, I think what we're really going to see is 
when you start to see more and more of these successful independent games that are doing interesting things with game design that are not just succeeding on the backs of very of, of, of strong conventions coming from shooters or coming from uh, or, or coming from an action game, is that they're working and they're finding an audience. That you're going to see publishers that might ease up on the level of anxiety that seems to surround, like, okay, we, we have to do something with a three or four or a five on it. Maybe we'll get to the point where we could have, like, the $15 million game. You know? Have you, oh, go on. Yeah, please. Um, have you heard about the work uh, Chris Roberts is doing? Yes, yes. Uh, Star Citizen? I know that's, yes. like, an extraordinary case, but that is kind of one of those things where the game is being completely funded on its own, and there's no loan from any publisher, and they're just doing it kind of how they want, and they don't have, really have to worry about that funding issue and the income issue that you talked about before. Right. I mean, those would be incredibly rare instances. And yeah. Chris Roberts is, in every way, shape, and size, a very, a very, very rare instance. I was thinking more of the young teams yeah. that are of two or three or four people that right now, you know, when, when, when you're at the age which you might be at right now where yeah. you can put up with a level of suffering I can no longer put up with. And that <laughs> over time you're going to want to put yourself in a more secure situation, especially if you have a family. But we don't need to have the extraordinarily high budgets that we see for the Call of Duties, that we see for the Tomb Raiders and everything. And we don't need to have the absolute, like, just, just such stringent budgets that a lot of these indies are working with that maybe there's something there in the middle. We did start to get there with American cinema back in the later 90s, and we still see that now, where it's independent in spirit, but there's a lot more money in it than, say, what Richard Linklater had to make uh, Slacker with. Yeah. I think that is a natural evolution. We might really see some very, very interesting products. If you look at the level of imagination you're seeing in indie games right now, it's like, okay, but what if there was just that much more money? I think the game Brothers is yeah. an excellent example of that because you are dealing with Remedy, who is an experienced AAA developer that really took a lot of their learning, their knowledge, and probably some of their financial benefits and applied it to a game that's far more unique and smaller in scope. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's a really good question from the chat about this exact thing. Um, uh -huh. Nate, Nate Zigetti says, do you think Gone Home's critical success along with other games like Journey, will be recognized by big developers and could cause a shift that will take place in the AAA market, or will it just be left to sort of smaller indie devs to make those experiences? You know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, I think you, you can't look at all of these publishers as like kind of, of, of one hive mind. You have to look at them as uh, some, there, there are some good people that work at publishers, and there are some people who are only going to look at the bottom line. I don't know who they are, and I don't think that you only have bottom line people at EA. I think you have some creative people. I think, you know, what always will get everyone's attention is if a game like Gone Home or Journey or Papers, Please sells so much money. If you have, like, a paranormal activity situation mm -hmm. where this thing made so much money and it made one person or one, you know, or, and the, I can't remember, I think it was Fox, made them so much money, everyone started falling over themselves to find the next one. We haven't seen that happen yet from an indie game, but what we do have happening is people starting to notice that there's a shift out there, that there's talent out there, and there's ideas out there, and I think the good people who are willing to take a little bit more of a chance are bringing them inside. Sony is doing this. I mean, they, you know, a lot of the stuff we saw at that Gamescom press conference was showing that there was some willingness to invest in risky projects that are doing things differently because it may become important now to try to distinguish yourself, and one of these things may actually work. It's interesting. It's actually like, speaking of big publishers, it was like, just at the end of last week, Majesco launched their own indie games label called Midnight City, and um, they're publishing like the, oh, I can't remember his name, um, but the, the new game by the guy who did um, some iPhone games. Yes. It begins with a Z. Yes. Ah. Uh, anyways, like, it, it's just a cool example of like, bigger publishers realizing that indie games, much like we see Sony doing, are like, like that is kind of the future. This middle tier between the small $10 Xbox Live Arcade game and the $60 retail yeah. game. I mean, and I, I, I think this will be benefited also as you shift over to the digital purchase model, um, that where the pricing can ideally get a lot more elastic. So it isn't, oh, I'm only getting my $60, you know, I have my $60 experience and I have my $10 experience. There's not to say there can't be a $20 experience, a $30 experience, that, you know, something like that happens that really does open up a lot more opportunities. Um, I, I, you know, you, you, you can't look at indie without also considering the economics, and I think those two things really might help chart some new territory that's ideally going to be beneficial to everyone. All right, let's, let's uh, bring somebody else back in. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's talk to Chris Weddle. 
Chris oh, wow. disappeared as soon as I clicked on him. Oh no, that's just this wow. yeah, I can't take the attention. I'm gonna run. No, <laughs> yeah, go away. No. Go away. I guess I, I, I clicked. Oh dear. I clicked too hard on him. Uh, but here's uh, Nate. Nick Robinson. Newton. Hard clicker. Hard clicker. <laughs> hey Nate, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? Ooh, I like. Is, is that a Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yes. Does that remind you? Yeah, yeah, that makes me happy. That Nick doesn't know anything about that, but that's it for another place don't, and another. Don't wrap me out. Don't <laughs> wrap me out. <laughs> I, had to, I had to introduce my sister to the movies about a couple of years ago. She'd never seen them, and it's just like to me that's blasphemy. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, there's so many things that I and I, I've I've had this with my wife, where I realized, oh, you don't know about this certain piece of pop culture. So I was thinking about all the things I've talked to her about and all the metaphors I've used and all the references I've made. I'm like, I must have looked like a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> doing that. That's the great thing about being a nerd. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah I always forget that we, we all have a shared experience that we can talk in code with. That doesn't work outside of these types of moments. Sounds like a hive mind. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Nate, what's, 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 what's on your mind? A uh, couple things, actually. Uh, I woke up this morning and saw the Xbox release date, which yeah. I find it interesting that it's a week after PS4. It's kind of, I don't know, I figured that they would have done something maybe a little bit earlier, but at the same time, it's also kind of making sense that it's a little bit closer maybe to Black Market, maybe, like Black Friday, and maybe that's what they're looking for, but um, I don't I know, it seems really five. weird. I don't know, I just came across this kind of random. Okay, so I had two reactions. One is, oh God, really, they're one week apart. Because from a, I have to work like that <laughs> on that level, it's a little bit terrifying. I was surprised too. I thought Sony had left the door open for something dramatic to happen to Microsoft, uh, that they could have gone two weeks early. That, that was something that was not completely out of the question. And I think a lot of us were considering that possibility because they seem to be so in bed with Call of Duty. Why not match up with, it, with, with exactly. the release of those? Um, I don't know why. I have not tried to contact anybody over there to get an explanation. The explanation they offered was not comforting. And that is, it's the same day that they launched the Xbox 360 on. And you know what my reaction to that was? Oh, yeah. I guess that's when they launched the Xbox 360. It's oh, not that I, I don't have a scrapbook of my day last November 22, 2006, and my wonderful time I had getting my Xbox 360. That is a date of nostalgia to a very few group of people, the most of whom no longer work at Microsoft. Exactly. So um, exactly. that was not that was not the best response. Here's my two things that I think might be behind it. Um, one, supply. They, I, I don't know. I mean, with Larry Herb, Ma Major Nelson, just released a photo of I guess the first one that came off the manufacturing line. So we know they're being made. Yeah, they just I, put something out about that, I think, yesterday, about how they updated the CPU, uh, some part of the CPU. It's I not yeah. CPU. Is it the clock speed, or maybe it is the CPU? Yeah, it was, the, it, it was increased from, I think it was 1.6 megahertz to 1.75 megahertz. Yeah, it was that. Yeah, it was, it was like a, I thought it was like a 0.25 or maybe a little bit less improvement. Yeah, so, but I heard, I heard somewhere... Five, something about that. Yeah, I heard somewhere that from a developer standpoint, oh, that little difference matters a lot. Oh, no, so I, this I could imagine. be big. But that, I mean, that could be it right there. Um, I, what, 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 I guess what's disconcerting is the idea that that thing wasn't locked down much, much earlier. Yeah. Um, because you, you, you make a change like that, how does that affect the firmware? You know, drivers, things like that. Are developers dealing with everything they need so that they have their games up and ready to go for the Xbox One at the launch of it? Now that, you know, how many can they have at the launch? I, the one thing I can assure you, there's always a sense that, like, oh, the shortage was, yeah, it, they literally tried to short their supply to create demand. That is not the case, especially this time. When you, even though there is a $100 price difference, if someone wants a brand new console, and right now there's only a handful of software that's unique to both of them, if they go in the store and one is not available but the other is, they're probably going to lose that sale 50, 60 percent of the time. Exactly. A shortage for Sony and Microsoft right now would be devastating. So in my guts tell me that's probably why they decided yeah, they had to go with that date, so they could have amassed that much so that the retailers will not be selling out as quickly as they did last generation. But I think it also might be that we're going to have to look at them getting the firmware, the OS, and all that kind of stuff that's you know that's on, that's on the software side of it ready to go. I mean, as, as one of my colleagues, Arthur Gee, said, this thing might be coming in hot. And, you know, we're, I, we're, we're probably going to start to hear leaks and rumors to this effect for the next few months. But I think when they decided to hold back for as long as they did after Sony to then announce the date after Sony, 
doesn't indicate to me that that's a position of strength. If they had said that we're going to be ready on the 5th, I think that's when Call of Duty comes out, that's a position of strength. So Sony is looking like, I don't know what their, what their thinking was to go with that date, but it just it, that's how I'm reading the narrative. As I said before, this is speculation and supposition. It's not informed. So well, it still brings well, up an interesting point, too. I mean, it's just it's everything you said. It's just really fascinating that they're... It's weird how much they've kind of tanked recently. Like, their marketing message has been really abhorrent, if you want to put it that no, way. It's, no, just no, been, no. it's just been really awful. And I mean, as much as they're doing, they're doing their best to kind of fix that, it's still so much mixed messaging that it's leading anyone who's not really, like, in the major game, like, reads gaming sites, it leaves the ma main normal consumer, if you want to put it that way, really confused as to what's going on. No, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's already up on our site. I encourage you all to see it. I did an interview with a gentleman uh, who worked on kind of the product development uh, side of things over at Microsoft. And I was quite taken aback by how honest he was in the course of the interview, but it doesn't change the fact that, like, Gamescom was a great opportunity for them to really reshape that message, and they didn't. You know, they didn't go live, and I'm glad they didn't now that I saw what the recorded uh, event was, but they didn't have a nice signature thing to kind of rally around, a new way for people to look at, at, at the Xbox One. Um, a, a, additionally, I don't think that they're going to be able to do that strong of showing at TGS. They're in Sony's home turf at TGS, and I expect Sony, there's now rumors what they might be announcing. I find that to be more believable. That is a point of pride. It's a point of national pride. It's a point of business pride. Um, I, I don't see where Microsoft has another opportunity going forward to really kind of get the attention back on them and change that, that dialogue. I agree with you 100%, Nate. It, it's, yeah. it's been a very strange and baffling ride to see how this has all played out. At the same time, it's fascinating to watch. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Okay. Remember, I'm a journalist, so good or bad, oh, yeah. there's still something to write and talk about. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally agree. I think the past couple months have been a nice reminder of how awesome it is that there isn't a clear winner and that there's competition, because I feel like the headline every four days now is Microsoft saying, oh, we're doing that thing that Sony's doing, or vice versa, and it's just like this escalation, this arms race that really benefits all of us who just want to play good video games. Yeah. Because everything I just said is like, oh, Adam just said Sony's going to win. I don't know. The, 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 the messaging is really bad. I think sales by year's end, but for the two new consoles, will be quite close. Very, very close. Um, I think we're not going to see the shakeout for another year, and Microsoft has one advantage, and it's called Titanfall. The hours for that game so looking for at that. were four hours long. They were cutting off the line within hour, like an hour of the pack show floor opening. That is the standout next-gen game, and they wrapped that up as fundamentally an exclusive. It'll also be on PC. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, I'll, there's still so many things in play right now that I am nowhere near confident to say there's a winner or a loser. I can say that up to this point, Microsoft has screwed up, and Sony's had a much stronger message, but I don't think I've ever seen... I've never been this excited to see the launches happen, because it is unclear how these chips are going to fall. And I bet we're going to yeah. still have this, this type of discussion for six, if not 12 months after the launches. And, uh, De and uh, Bungie has now kind of sided with the dark horse in the situation with Sony... Not that, not that it's an exclusive, but you know, it has a very PlayStation-heavy slant with yeah, the next well, generation. It, it, it did at E3, and that could change too. Watch Dogs had a very, very strong slant uh, with Sony, but then now we're starting to see a little bit more affiliation with Microsoft. Ubisoft has now taken the division and affiliated that more with Microsoft. We saw that at Gamescom. I think you're going to start seeing you're, 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 you're seeing these major third-party publishers like EA and Ubisoft who are now like, hold on a second, it's unclear where I should be throwing my lot in with. In fact, if you want to get a better sense of where the confidence level is with Sony or Microsoft, don't look to Sony or Microsoft. Look to EA, look to Ubisoft, look to Deep Silver and a lot of those publishers out there. Mm -hmm. Nick, uh, what's happening out there in the chat? Did I rile um, people up with what I just said? <laughs> not necessarily, but there's a lot of people talking about the future of the Vita. Um, Killer B seven zero three five asks if you think like the focus on indie titles for the Vita will make up for the lack of AAA titles. Chow one 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 wants to know how you feel about the future of Vita in general, and that extends I, to all you guys. I I, I mean, honestly, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Vita, and a lot of those indie games are really fun. Spelunky being a stand up is fun to play in the Vita. Um, it's really strange that they are putting such a heavy push on a piece of hardware when they are launching the PlayStation Four, which is another piece of hardware. Um, this might be a really, really long play on their part. 
I understand that the two are linked up, but we don't have a ridiculous number of sales for the Vita, and people, I think, are eyeballing the PS4. When they put down that amount of money on the PS4, I don't think they're looking to get another piece of hardware. They're looking to get software for it. It's not, to me, a very, very clear plan on their part, and, um, I mean, I, I cannot wait to play Tearaway. I think that will be one of the most exciting things of this year. But I, I, I think their push on Vita right now sounds like old Sony, not like new confident Sony. Um, and, and you know, like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with the system. It's just a very, very strange business play. Interesting. Uh, let's uh, talk to Reed Clayton. Reed, where Ooh. are you? Utah. Where are you reaching us from? Utah. I think, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we've gotten a, a guy from Utah on, on address the set, so welcome on behalf of your entire state. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's, your, what's, what's on your mind? Two things. One, Sester, give me your pants! <laughs> I'm actually, I, I, I found some pants. Hey, just so everyone knows, <laughs> oh, yeah, let's, let's look at Adam's shirt. Pants t-shirt. Which, and that's a shameless plug, you too can wear the pants t-shirt by going to web3games.com slash store. We have actually a whole bunch of new shirts that we announced at PAX. There, I found a great segue. Reed, what's on your mind? Um, this is something I was getting to. I, I finally got back to playing uh, Fallout New Vegas, and I said, let's play, let's play out some mods. Some of these mods I've been seeing, it's like, like some like the, people add stories to it. I'm like, why don't we see some of these people that do these mods go into the game community, they, they, they can make some great stuff here. Why don't they try and do something like that more often? Well, I mean, yeah. to be fair, quite a few mods have gotten some people jobs. Um, you know, an indie team became responsible for Portal, and uh, Counter-Strike was a mod that I think did very, very well. Um, I, I, I think these guys are being eyeballed. Um, I don't know why some get picked and some don't. Um, one of the problems might be Fallout New Vegas which just is not where a lot of people's attention are. I was going to ask you, how does it play these days? Uh, is pretty well. Is, is, is that too stable? I mean, I finally had to give up on that game. After <laughs> working really hard, just having the whole thing just, just take a crap on me. <laughs> Losing a lot of work. But, just, I mean, I, 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 I must work. <laughs> modding does get you kind of far. Um, you know, not every mod goes that way. And I sometimes am left in a, in a state of bafflement at the amount of work and delicate care that people put into some mods, where obviously they're they're not making a dime off of it. It's it, it is it is it is a fascinating culture. Yeah, that's the thing that surprised me so much. It's like why don't they, like people should really open themselves up and say, "Come on, man, put yourselves out there. You might get honest jobs that might actually help you out in your life." I know, I know. It's like I'm not. I I I I, I advise a lot of people who kind of work in the world that I'm in and stuff like that. I'm not a fan of giving away stuff for free. I don't think it's the wisest idea. I think you set a, a, a bad precedent. And actually, to apply that more to the game marketplace, when you start selling your games at 99 cents, when you try to charge three bucks, you have a huge problem on your hands. So it's, it's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a very interesting point that you bring up, Reed. I, I, I really appreciate that one. So, <laughs> hey, Nick? Mm -hmm. Just so we don't leave anybody out, let's see if we can get to our last two people in this room. Yeah, let's uh, talk to Ryan Hicks. Ryan Hicks, where are you reaching us from? Uh, hey, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Awesome, awesome. So uh, what, what, what's, what's on your mind? Uh, so kind of going back to the Mighty Number no. 9 thing, um, it's kind of a, kind of a three-part thing. Uh, do you think Capcom will ever make an official statement about you know, how they feel what kind of statement do you think they would make? And regardless of the statement, do you as an outside observer feel that they have any legal grounds to sue Unifune? All right, so I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to that third one very comfortably, but okay, let's let's go with the first one. How do you think they feel? That, it, it doesn't look good to them. Um, what was, and, and Nick, you might be able to help me out here. Oh, the Veronica Mars movie. Mm -hmm. I think this is comparable to that. That here was a movie that clearly had been presented to some studios, and they turned it down. They go to Kickstarter. They see this groundswell of support, and there's just something like, "Hold on, hold on, what's going on here?" Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Capcom publishes the game, uh, and then maybe it gets reskinned as Mega Man. That you know, obviously, it's now become self-financed, so there's a lot of risk for Capcom. Uh, they could potentially you know put it out there and resolve this kind of. This isn't the best of PR situations, 
Um, but do you think Inafune would be into that? Like he's had so he's gone through so much with so like with Capcom. Like they canceled his game. Like he's. I wonder I'm almost if he would just be too proud. Um, I would hope that he doesn't. Honestly, yeah. I mean, who who is that? Eddie Kessler? Was that you, Max? That was a sensation. Sa- ah, station. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of us wouldn't. And I I, I guess the one thing is. Don't try to build too much of a story around these things. It's kind of fun for us to observe it. Yeah. We assume he's so angry, he's going to do this. <laughs> but at the same time, let's say he raises $3 million for this game. And Capcom says, okay, you give us the three, and we'll give you another three, and you can make the game. And no one else is willing to. Hmm. I would like him to then make even more of the game that he wants to make with the support and with the marketing that comes behind it. Especially, uh, you know, it, Remember, guys, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's a business. And pride even in business really, really can screw things over, and it can really you know, pr- prevent the product from coming out and, and, and matters like that. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. I think with that kind of money and what his name is, I think there must be some publishers there that are sniffing around that you know understand they're probably going to have to give him free reign to make what he wants to make. But like that, you know, help him make it, help make money off of it, and help it get out there a little bit faster. Especially um, if that makes the difference between it coming to consoles or not. Like if you look at it, Xbox uh, and and PlayStation version of that game are a stretch goal right now. It's yeah. PC. Who knows? And, Sony, Sony with their new thing with all the indie stuff, or Microsoft with what they're saying about indie stuff, they could be knocking on that door. That could be one of those small things that could be, you know, really, really big. Legally, I don't know. I don't. I mean, a lot of this would probably fall under Japanese law, where I'm thoroughly uninformed <laughs> as to how that works. But I also don't think that he would go off half cocked without having had some good advice from someone that he would not be running afoul of of, of Comcast with their lawyers. So that's 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 kind of the way I read it. I'm oh, sorry, Ryan. I'm I'm sorry to move so quickly, but I want to make sure we get to our last one. Can you? Uh, yeah. Here's a the boss dev. The boss dev. Uh, what is that name for there, buddy? Actually, it's David. David. Wait. There we go. So, well, David, where are you reaching us from? Well, right, well, right now it's one fifty fifty four in the morning. Okay, so you're and not in the U S. That much you've determined. <laughs> yes, I actually had to stay up. At night to try to get here. Okay, are and you so in Central a, Europe right now? I'm Where in are you? I'm in Switzerland, Geneva. All right, so I was a little bit off on the full center, but yes, yeah. aha, I was close. Look at me, I figured that out. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I am now doubly glad we got to you, given the sacrifice you just made. Well, what's your Don't question? Don't worry. Actually, it's not really a question, but I'll try to in five minutes anyway. Uh huh. But like, thing is, I have like um. Two two things which I just know I'm hope something might happen in the video game world, uh-huh. well video game world I guess because the first one I hope kick, a Kickstarter game might be a success because I believe it could happen because you know if Kickstarter just happen just no it's done I think it's in the first stages people are not sure like no how much money can go with it and I hope no my nine could be might be a success thanks to Kickstarter. I, and I, also say, I, I think it's a very good chance here. And, and, and to your second point? And my second point is, I don't know. Uh, I mean, like, I just don't, I don't know. I hope in the future we might have a cross-platform video game where PlayStation PlayStation guys can compete against Xbox guys. I don't know. I just, mm-hmm. I just, I have friends who play Xbox, and I know I just, I have this dream that that one day might happen. And, and I, I and I have a dream of world peace. Um, that's I, never going to happen. Is is that's that's kind of, I don't think that's how they get you, but they're yeah. hoping to get the guy of your friend circle to buy the first console, and that will help determine all those other consoles that you want to buy. And yeah. the only way they can really motivate you is by not allowing for that cross play. They have two, I believe, very very different services. One day there might be the one game that straddles all of them, but I don't see where there's a benefit to Microsoft nor to Sony in that case. I think the best chance is one day we'll have something called the console, and it will be made maybe by a joint venture from all console manufacturers out there, just because the cost has become so prohibitive for any one company to go forward with it. Um, I, I, I think the idea of a successful Kickstarter, very, very likely. Cross-platform play, not to the PC. I understand, guys. Cross-platform play between those two, highly, highly unlikely. I might, you know, you know what? If it does happen, we'll get back and we'll have this conversation again. 
Well, anyway, oh. just hope, you know, Kickstarter, Kickstarter game has success. And I'm waiting to see that happen. Yeah. Who knows? Well, Maybe there's too many, might... games, too many talented people that have been funded by Kickstarter for all of them to be a failure. Um, I don't think all of them will be a success, but no, one of these is going to break out, and you're right. That's going to help change the conversation and the apprehension and the speculation that I think we're all under as we're waiting for one of these major Kickstarter titles to finally see the light of day and get into our hands. All right, guys, speaking of getting into my hands, um, I need to put a pillow there because <laughs> I have been running on fumes since the week before PAX. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for joining us here on Address the Cess. We're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. Um, something is going to happen between now and then. Oh, most importantly, everybody say thank you to Nick. Hardworking Nick. Thank you. You're, thank you're you. awesome. Aww. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, once again, I really, really appreciate you guys joining. It's a lot of fun. Uh, as tired as I was, it's always worth it. We'll see you here soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.